All right. Uh, enforced poverty, so economic dependence. Uh, if you keep a group uh, physically intimidated, the next thing you do to oppress them is you keep them poor. So there's lots of ways to do this. So first of all, African Americans, by and large, 90% of them during this time period, Jim Crow, lived in the South. The South is very rural, so the p prototypical black person is a sharecropper in the South. Um, black people that lived in cities in the South, Birmingham, Atlanta, etc., you might have a job scrubbing toilets, etc., etc. If you're a black woman, you probably work as a maid in someone's home. Uh, if you're a black man, you are a laborer. You probably work at a factory, but not in a union and co-equal with the white workers, but you're probably mopping the floors and such and paid far less. There were black jobs and there were white jobs. And sharecropping was the job for black labor in the South. Picking cotton, same job you did in slavery days. This system is a bit better, but it's not wonderful by any means. So first of all, January 1st every year, you have to sign a contract that says, I have a job and here's the terms of my employment. You had to show it to the sheriff. If you didn't do that, you were guilty of vagrancy. Vagrancy laws make it illegal to not have a job. So these sharecropping contracts were usually very horrible. I think I described them to most of my classes when we did uh, the black codes during reconstruction. So you work the crop, you give a percentage of it to the boss as a form of rent. Now, it was a very, very hard thing to do. Everything could go wrong when you're cultivating cotton. You could have a drought, a flood. You could have bull weevil, which is an insect that gets into cotton and eats it. Uh, you could get sick. Your kids could get sick. You could break a leg or something. And then you can't work very hard to cultivate the cotton. You're numbers go down and you become then indebted to your boss. And if you're in debt, then you can't quit. They had these um, laws that enforce this called convict surety bonds. So the 13th Amendment has an exception. It says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist in the United States except as a punishment for a crime where the accused will be duly tried and convicted. So let's say you're guilty of vagrancy. You didn't sign one of these sharecropping laws. Then you go to prison and then you are literally auctioned off on the auction block white landowners could go down to the jail and go to the sheriff and say, I would like to essentially purchase. Now, the black person is willingly doing this, but how willing is this? If you're in prison and the conditions are horrible, which they were in the 19th century, then you can't really say no to these kind of things. What you do is you negotiate with the white landowner who will pay a certain amount in a bond and you will work for him for a certain term of service, and then you pay off your debt that way. And so it was very common as late as the 1930s for people to travel through the South and see a cotton field and see black men shackled together working the cotton crop, wondering, I thought slavery died out a long time ago. Well, these aren't slaves, they're convicts. Well, black men filled up the prisons in the South during that time period. And to a large extent, this is still a problem in America today. Not the convict surety bonds, but over-incarceration of African Americans. A hundred years ago, it was far, far worse, though. This was completely grotesque. Second, enticement laws. Get this, this is the most un-American thing one could probably think of. It was illegal in the South to offer a person a job or to take a job if you already had a job as an agricultural laborer. So it discriminates against African Americans. So the way this works is you are a very industrious black worker. You may not even be a sharecropper. You're a laborer on a farm paid a very, very low wage. And you're industrious though. You're hardworking. You're two, three times as productive as every other worker. A white landowner sees you on someone else's farm and says, hey, I'm going to double your salary. Come work for me. That was illegal under the South system. So this is anti-capitalist. Everybody is poorer because of this. One of the beautiful things about capitalism is it doesn't discriminate about race. Everyone can move up. You have social mobility. Well, that wasn't the case under this system. You couldn't move up. You were trapped in this cycle of poverty. Next, industrial agent laws. The way this worked is in the North, they, for their factory steel mills, mines, they would prefer white laborers from Europe. So you have Polish laborers being recruited by Andrew Carnegie coming to his factories in Pittsburgh and Cleveland and working very hard. Now let's say temporarily for a few months or a year, um, you can't do that. There's a war, there's a famine, there's some sort of problem and you can't get any more Polish laborers and you have a labor shortage and you got to fill those contracts. 
So occasionally Carnegie would send industrial agents down to the South to recruit young black men, pay their sharecropping debts, and move them up uh, to Cleveland or Pittsburgh to work in the steel mill. Now, if you're the black worker, this is wonderful for you. There's opportunity. The schools are better in the North. You can vote. There's better opportunities. You get more money. If you're Andrew Carnegie, this is good. For everybody, this is good. In the South, they passed laws to prevent this. That was illegal to do, which is extraordinary. It violates all kinds of federal laws about interstate commerce, and the federal government just let the South do this. Uh, schools. Schools in the South, of course, were segregated. You had black schools, you had white schools. Um, now, at the time, everybody thought, well, black people are getting an education, white people are getting an education, it's separate, it's equal, what's the problem? Well, first of all, there's two problems with this. Number one, there's the actual problem of inequality in the actual quantity of education, meaning that in the South, what they started to do is have equal schools. You'd have first through eighth grade for white, first through eighth grade for black. Then, as time went on, they started to get high schools, and they'd have 1st through 12th for black, 1st through 12th for white. And that was just incredibly expensive to run those kind of programs. So, in hard economic times, like the 1890s, we had a depression. Many southern states would just totally eliminate high school for black people. They would just say, we don't have the money to do it. And in these debates, they would often say things like, what do black people need uh, 12 years of education before they're going to be cotton pickers anyway? We'll just eliminate it. So this is clearly unequal, clear violation of the 14th Amendment. Literally, southern states had these systems where they said white people get 12 years of education, black people get six years. Clearly unequal on the face of it. Supreme Court did nothing to stop this kind of thing. I'll give you a statistic. In the state of Florida, the entire state of Florida, in the 1920s, there were only four black high schools in the entire state. You had to be the cream of the crop, the tip of the top, to even get a high school education if you were black. There were only a handful of black universities in the whole South. You had Howard University in D.C., you had the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, you had Fisk in Nashville and Tennessee. That was basically it, and very, very few. The absolute pinnacle of black achievement was to get a college education, which only a handful of people did. Third, we have political disfranchisement. So this is taking away the ability to fight back against the system. One of the wonderful things about democracy, it's self-corrective. If a group is oppressed, then they can vote, organize, debate, and then change the system using democracy. It's like an ecosystem where it self-corrects. Unless you have a system like this, where you take away the ability for people to fight back. So, how did they do this? Number one, poll tax. They would charge people... Uh, a fee to vote. Now, elections are expensive, but today we have much better ways to run them. We tax income, we tax sales, and we run elections off of those fees. And the rich subsidize the poor, which is the way that it should be, most of us would say today. That's the progressive way. In a democracy, you should never charge people to vote, because that would discourage the most vulnerable of us, the poor and people of color, from going out and voting. So, five dollars to vote. Now, five dollars is not a lot of money today. But in 1890s in Mississippi, it was a huge sum of money. Most black sharecroppers never even saw any cash. And $5 represented this huge percentage of your income. It would be like charging somebody $1,000 or $5,000 today to vote. I wouldn't vote if it was $1,000. I could afford that, but I wouldn't charge that because that means I can't buy things for myself or my family. And so that right there got rid of pretty much every black person's right to vote in the South, and a lot of white people's too. So what the South would do to make up for the white people is they would have these ridiculous uh, laws wrapped up in their literacy tests. So the second way that you prevent black people from voting is the literacy test. You make people take a test to prove that they can read and write. We don't want ignorant people voting, right? People who aren't educated, people who can't read. Now, understand that that's the theory there's very little substance backing up that theory. These literacy tests were not intended to test the ability of someone to read and write. They were passed with the intention of getting universal failure. Meaning, I took one of these when I went to graduate school. They gave us one of these, Mississippi's 1900 literacy test, and I failed it. Because 
the test is ridiculous. It doesn't test whether you can read or write. It's basically a speed reading test and you have to get 100% accuracy. You read a passage, usually some legal text about the 14th Amendment, some case, some statute, you read it, and then there's like 20 tasks that you have to perform. It says, number one, I want you to underline the fourth letter of the 18th word of this paragraph. And you're going and counting and furiously circling, highlighting, underlining, performing all the tasks. I didn't finish on time. If you don't finish on time, you fail the literacy test. If you get one question wrong, you fail the literacy test. Because black people went to inferior schools, because the quantity and quality, we didn't talk about quality that much, but imagine even the people that are getting an education, black people in the South, the books are worn down, the teachers aren't as good, and the education system isn't as good, so there's no opportunities there. Even black people that could read and write couldn't pass these kind of tests. It was designed to generate, like I said, nearly 100% failure. So let's say you do pass the test. You're one of the one or two percent of African Americans who can pass the test. You got your five dollars, you can register to vote. What difference does it make when a thousand times the number of white people as you can vote? And there's an exception to the literacy test, meaning if you are white and you fail the literacy test, there's a clause in the statute that says, okay, we feel bad if you failed the literacy test. If you can furnish proof that your grandfather voted in this county, then you're good to go. If your grandfather voted and your father could vote, then you probably could vote too. And we don't want people to regress in American society. We want them to progress. So this is ridiculous. Clearly, if it's 1895, whose grandfathers could vote? Well, surely white people, because they were free. They had the vote since the days of Andrew Jackson in the 1830s. Any white man could vote. And now that allows you to get out of the literacy test, essentially. If you're black, oh, my grandfather couldn't vote. He was a slave. Oh, funny how that works. The law wasn't color-coded on its face. It didn't say black people can't vote. They just sort of rigged the system. It's sort of like today in Saudi Arabia. I saw an interview with uh, Mohammed bin Sultan recently where he was asked about women being oppressed and they don't have political rights. He said women can vote in Saudi Arabia, which was shocking to me. I didn't know that women could vote. But when you look into it, technically women can vote in Saudi Arabia, but until recently women couldn't drive. Women aren't allowed outside the host, house without a, uh, a male escort, essentially, a male family member. So if you're a woman and you want to vote, you need to get your husband's permission uh, and he has to go with you to the voter registrar's office to supervise and to authorize that you have the right to vote. So what happens? Very few women vote, and Saudi Arabia just says, well, we don't understand why. It's the same concept in the South during this time period. The South would just say, isn't that weird? Only 3% of the black population is voting. How is that possible? We don't know. The laws aren't racist. Not on their face, it doesn't say black and white, but they were designed to do this so they could deny any kind of wrongdoing. Early registration. So for an election in November, you have to register to vote in January. Now, January uh, has two holidays. It has New Year's Day and it has, in the South, every uh, state had Robert E. Lee Day as a holiday, holiday as well. And some states still do. In some southern states, they have fused together Robert E. Lee and Martin Luther King Day. I can't imagine something more contradictory than that, but they do that. Um... And those two holidays, coupled with the weekends, means that you probably got about 20 or 21 days out of the whole month to vote. The voter registrar's office is open from 10 to 12, and from 3 to 5, one or two days out of the week. And so, if the wind blew the wrong way, meaning if the calendar was not quite right, you might only have about 20 hours or so in the whole month of January to register to vote for an election in November. So this, again, set up another barrier. It made it harder and harder and harder to vote, and that will disproportionately affect black people. Whites who have more education, more resources will be able to vote. Blacks did not. Um, and then finally, social humiliation. This is what we know the most about. I wanted to go in great detail on A, B, and C because it's not talked about as much. What we see today, when we watch movies like The Help or when we see movies like Green Book, we see white and colored. We see the segregation, the separate drinking fountains. Now, all that is true, but understand that's just a small part of the puzzle. It was done to reinforce everything else. So I want you to understand just how elaborate this was. When you actually delve into the details, it's unbelievably perverse and grotesque. So I want you to understand this. Hospitals were segregated. Uh, 
Transportation lines like trolley cars, trains, buses, completely segregated. Schools were segregated. Uh, restaurants were segregated. Hotels were segregated. Businesses were segregated. Everything was segregated. Even after death, cemeteries were segregated. This really, to me, highlights just the perversity of this problem. If you are concerned about whom is buried next to you after you die, then you have a problem. And this is something that whites obsessed over. When they would be taking care of their fathers and grandfathers and they were just about to die, they'd go buy them a plot. The first question you ask, is this a whites-only cemetery? Because grandfather has to be buried in a whites-only cemetery. It was a system which very few questioned, but the few that did, it seemed absolutely bizarre. This is a crazy, crazy system. And you almost feel sorry for white racists because rather than worry about the education of their kids and getting a leg up, poor white folks in Mississippi who didn't have a dime to their names were more worried about these kind of things, which didn't matter at all in the grand scheme of things than their own family and moving up in the system. You would rather be poor as long as black people were poorer than you than have everybody have opportunities and a black person might have more wealth than you. So... Let's talk about how the Supreme Court ruled on all these kind of things. Basically, the rule at the time was if the law on the face of it discriminates against a political right, then it would be struck down. If you actually said blacks can't serve on juries or blacks can't vote, that would be struck down. But if you use a clever go around, if you say poll tax, literacy test, etc., etc., those would all be upheld. And so this whole system was basically approved by the Supreme Court. The uh, case, the landmark case that really authorizes all of this is the infamous Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896. So the case is really interesting, so let's just for a minute or two talk about the case. So Homer Adolph Plessy was a Creole from Louisiana. Now, the case is very atypical of the actual Southern situation. First of all, it's Louisiana. Louisiana had originated as a Catholic colony, so the slavery system during colonial periods was way different, and the legacy of that is men like Plessy. Plessy was seven-eighths white, one-eighth black, so that means he had one black great-great-grandma, which is common in Louisiana and atypical, meaning that the average black person in Mississippi is... Uh, a higher proportion of African ancestry uh, and more identifiable, meaning Plessy had such fair skin that he could almost blend in as a white man. A lot of people didn't know he was black. Therefore, he was born in the 1840s uh, as a free man. He was not a slave because he had some African ancestry. There was some discrimination, but he actually grew up in a system that allowed him to get a college education, uh, to learn music, uh, at an academy equal with whites, and to get a law degree uh, at a university, he spoke English and French. He was actually an upper, upper, upper middle class black man, if you want to classify him as black, because he's only one-eighth black. Well, the laws in the 1890s had what was called the, quote, one-drop rule. You had to define black and white. If you're going to have all these laws about blacks and whites, then you have to define what they are. White is defined as purity. You have to be 100% white to be white, any corruption of that blood, any percentage, the one drop rule, if any, one drop of black blood makes you black. And so therefore, Pl Plessy, this is crazy when you think about it, he was born a white man and he became black one day in the 1890s because he was born in the 1840s when the French legal system was still there and they had a system that was not the one drop rule. They had the preponderance rule, okay? If you were more than 51%, one thing or the other, then you fell under that legal category. So he has a lot to lose here. He was born a white man. He had all these privileges and had this great life. And then one day, Louisiana tried to take it all from him. What happened was he rode on uh, a train. He bought a first-class ticket. That's a euphemism for white. White people get to ride in the first-class part of the train. And they have conductors, conductors or race cops, basically, who patrol everything in the South to make sure everything's segregated. No black person sitting in the white section of the theater, the bus depot, anything like that. And at first he doesn't recognize Plessy and he has to even ask the question, are you black? To which Plessy replied, well, yes, partially. And he's arrested on the spot. He challenges it. It goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And so you have this question. 
can you legally do this? The 14th Amendment actually says that you can't discriminate on the basis of race. You have the Equal Protection Clause. It says no state shall deny to any citizen uh, the equal protection of the laws, which seems to say that you can't just treat people differently in your state because they're of a different ancestry. And what does the Supreme Court say? Amazingly, this is bizarre, eight to one, the Supreme Court says this law is fine. We're not going to try to strike it down. No violation of the 14th Amendment. Now, it's weird because Republicans had won so many elections since 1860, since Lincoln, the Supreme Court was overwhelmingly Republican, and the man who wrote the opinion, Justice Brown, was from Massachusetts, and his father was an abolitionist, and he felt this is fine. It gets weirder. The man who wrote the dissent saying, no, we fought the Civil War to get rid of this kind of system, uh, Justice uh, Harlan wrote an opinion essentially saying uh, that this was unconstitutional and these kind of laws, segregation laws, had to go. But he was just one on the Supreme Court writing a dissenting opinion. The weird thing is Justice Harlan was born in Kentucky. He was actually a slave owner uh, in his earlier days, and he had a change of heart at one point. So it's a bizarre case, and it was the law of the land. So once the Supreme Court's ruled on it, it just opens up the floodgates. Every southern state started passing these segregation laws. Now, you can't do it with respect to political rights directly. Black men can't vote. Black men can't serve on juries. You can't do that. You have these uh, intermediary ways to do it. Literacy tests, poll taxes. But you can do it with respect to anything that's not political, where you can sit in a theater, whom you can marry. Blacks and whites could not intermarry. Um, literally, who you could have in your own home. I can't imagine anything more oppressive. If you were a white person, you could not invite a black man over, or black woman or black family, over for dinner to your home. That was illegal during the Jim Crow system. It might even get you lynched. And that was illegal during the system. So as you might imagine, this is a, a network of an array of vast different laws that made it virtually impossible for any black person to move up through the system. So before we move on to the next slide, I just want to illustrate uh, the picture here for you. The black woman in the picture there is Miss Ida Wells. Uh, she was one of the very, very few people talking about this during the time, um, shedding light on lynching because no one wanted to talk about it. Whites in the North either thought this was exaggerated, it can't be as bad as you're saying, or I don't really care about it, that's a state issue, I don't want to be involved in it. And so she tried and tried and tried to get white people to, to sympathize with the plight of black people. She was born in Tennessee, and she moved to Memphis, and she actually wrote for a black newspaper there. There were a handful of those in the South, not very many. And what really changed her was an incident of a black man who owned a general store. Now, what happened was there was a black man in Memphis who saved up enough money, bought himself a general store, and was making very good money on the black side of town. He was doing so well, in fact, that white folks would actually go to the black side of town to go shop at his store because he had better prices and better service and kept a better store than most of the whites. Now, this was technically legal in Memphis. Most of the rest of the South, this is unheard of, a black man actually doing well in business. And so it violated the social code, letter A, physical intimidation. So whites at first started to say, you're taking our business away, we won't allow this, you need to close up your shop and get the hell out of town. He ignored this, and one morning he was found brutally murdered, his body just left in a cornfield, and his eyes were completely gouged out. This really affected Ida Wells, and she therefore decided to leave the South behind. She moved up to Chicago and opened up a black newspaper there and wrote about this incessantly, over and over again, documenting every lynching that she heard of. Every friend in the South said, I want you to hear this story of this awful murder of a black person and they just got away with it and she tried and tried and tried to shed light on this kind of stuff most whites ignored it a few would pay attention but we have this documentary evidence largely because of ida wells so thanks to her depressing story but i want you to understand the context of this that far too often you hear people say things like well slavery was a long time ago well first of all slavery was not that long ago it was only 150 years ago which is not that long in the grand scheme of things um second it wasn't as if slavery ended and then all of a sudden african americans had these great opportunities briefly during reconstruction but all that was taken away and then for 80 years after slavery the system replaced 
the uh, reconstruction system, and it's not until the 1960s that this system was systematically torn apart. That's just 50 years ago. And so we still are sort of living with the legacy of this, this horrible, horrible system that, thank goodness, we finally got rid of. Okay, last slide, number six, U.S. imperialism. So during this time, the United States is growing in strength, and that means not only economic, but also military. Now, the uh, U.S. started to build up a rather large navy, never had a large standing army. We always had a, a, a cultural norm against that. The British had that, monarchies of Europe had that, so we never really had a large standing army. We would beef up the army to fight a war, and then we would demobilize it and get rid of it as soon as there was peace. But most Americans felt it would be fine to have a large peacetime navy. Navies don't put uh, sailors at risk the way that armies do. Navy would never be able to perpetrate a coup on the U.S. Uh, political system. And so the U.S. starts building a rather large navy in the 1880s and starts flexing its muscles throughout the Caribbean and the Pacific. So what I want to talk about now is that there were two zones of control that the United States started to flex its muscles in. We are not going to uh, take any interest whatsoever in Africa or Asia. The Monroe Doctrine of 1823 says the Western Hemisphere belongs to the U.S. Asia and Africa, those belong to European countries, and you can colonize and dominate all you want. But we're going to prevent Europeans from coming into our hemisphere. So, the first zone of control would be the Caribbean. Now, to call it imperialism even raises the question, is this imperialism? In a way it is, but it's indirect, meaning... When the British went to India, or when they went to Kenya, or when they went to Ghana, they would just come in with the navy, the army would come ashore, they would take over a particular area, and plant the British Union Jack, and rule it directly from London. And all the people there would lose their political rights, they'd lose their land, everything. The U.S. did a different system in the Caribbean. That was thought as heavy-handed. The U.S. had this history against colonial domination. We are a colonial people, after all. We don't want to go around doing this. And so we did it in a more subtle kind of way. So here's what we would do in the Caribbean. So by the Caribbean, I mean, first of all, Central America. So Nicaragua, Honduras, Panama. We even create the country of Panama out of nothing. Um, Costa Rica, these countries, El Salvador. Also, uh, the Caribbean islands. So uh, after the Spanish-American War, Cuba will fall into this orbit, uh, Dominica, Haiti, and then all the various little tiny islands usually named after a saint, St. Thomas, St. Vincent, St. Martin. And so here's the way this would work. The U.S. would first shoulder or elbow out the European colonial power if there was still one there. Second, you would negotiate one-way trade deals with that country. You would go to Nicaragua, to the president and get on his good side. You don't replace him. You don't invade and get rid of him. You come to him and you essentially bribe him. You pay him off. You meet with him and you say, Mr. President, we would like you to be our guy. So sign this treaty that says that you must buy American goods only. You can't buy European goods at all. So we're going to build your railroads. We're going to sell you steel. We're going to sell you Coca-Cola and all these American products so U.S. markets can come in and dominate without any competition. The British did the same thing in India. They just did it by force. They controlled the ports. Here, Americans would negotiate deals where they wouldn't do that. Second, you would negotiate uh, the right to have U.S. military bases in these countries because we want to keep Europeans out of this particular area and we want to be able to control the hemisphere more. And the more bases you have, the more that you can control it. And so you negotiate the ability for the U.S. to have bases there, naval bases on, on the coastline. Now, this isn't going to be done for free. The president of these countries feels, you know, I'm an independent person, and this is my country and my people. Why should I do this? The U.S. has huge sacks of cash, and we're just going to bribe you. We're just going to pay you off. We're going to just say, here you go, and shut up. Don't say anything about it. Now, what happens if the locals don't like this? What happens if the Nicaraguan people say, well, our leader's just a puppet of U.S. imperialism. We don't like this, and there's a revolution. It happened from time to time. It happened in Nicaragua very often. It happened in Haiti very often. There would be an uprising. Well, essentially, the president of that country would call to the aid of the United States to do something about it because he's going to lose this gravy train, right? If you're the president of this country, you're making millions of dollars a year from U.S. bribes. You don't want to lose that. 
the U.S. would first train the police force of these societies, give military aid to put down these kind of rebellions, and failing that, at the behest of the country's request, if the president says, I'm under siege, help me, the U.S. Marines would come in, plant the flag, destroy the rebellion, and then install the president back in power. This is, um, this is the system, essentially, that existed at the time. Is it imperialism? It's hard to say, but it certainly is the U.S. flexing its muscles in the area. Some people might say it's bullying, but the U.S. did indeed do this to enrich ourselves, to get markets, and to uh, get naval bases, and to control the, this area uh, as much as possible. So we'll highlight two of these instances. Um, the first would be Panama. This is an extraordinary story. So Colombia, which controlled Panama at the time, Panama was just the northernmost state of Colombia uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century. And the Colombians have the idea that a canal is probably going to be dug across an isthmus, a little land bridge there they have connecting the Atlantic and Pacific. Everybody was talking about it for a long time, that going 15,000 miles around Chile and Argentina was inconvenient and that a canal would shave off 10,000 miles of that journey and it would facilitate trade, communication, transportation. Now, the British and French want to do a joint venture where they give the money to Colombia and they will control the canal. This is a direct violation of the Monroe Doctrine. And so Teddy Roosevelt is president in 1902. He gets wind that the French and British are bidding on this. Rather than outbid the French and British to the Colombians, the U.S. decides to create a country out of nothing. We go to people living in Panama, the northernmost state in Colombia. We ask them, would you like to be your own country? And they say, yes, of course. And we decide, okay, here's how it's going to go down. We want you to declare your independence and secede. Here's the weapons to do it. And then when Colombia tries to prevent that, we will use our force to stop them. And it goes down exactly as planned. The Panamanians secede, we give them the weapons, they try to fight off the Colombians. And then when Colombia tries to regain control over Panama, the U.S. Navy goes down to Cartagena, which is a city right on the coast of Colombia, and we start to shell the city and we start to use force against them. We then get a treaty from Colombia recognizing Panama's independence. We're the first country to recognize Panamanian independence. And then we meet with them and say, let's dig the canal. We'll pay you for it, and then we'll control it. And the U.S. controlled the canal until very recently in my lifetime, not in yours, but on December 31st, 1999, the U.S. gave the canal back to the Panamanians. We leased it and bought the rights for the 20th century, essentially. And it made the U.S. very wealthy and powerful because we can shut down this trade route in times of war. We can charge a tax on the vessels going uh, throughout it. And uh, this demonstrated the, the might of the American military. The second case is Venezuela. So this is a little bit later. This is 1903. And Venezuela was heavily, heavily indebted to European powers, the Germans, the British, and the French. And they defaulted on those debts, and they just stopped paying back the British investors who loaned them the money. And so Venezuela called on our help. They said, America, if the Monroe Doctrine means anything, you have to help us out because the British, French, and Germans started to blockade the Venezuela coastline, putting military pressure and economic pressure on them, using their navy in the Caribbean to stop the ability of Venezuela to trade with anyone else. And so Teddy Roosevelt just issued a threat. He just issued a warning. He said, I am adding a corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. A corollary is like a theorem that you can derive from another theorem. The Monroe Doctrine says that if any European power comes into our hemisphere, we will do war with them. This stated that if there was a threat that might happen, the U.S. can intervene anyway. And so Roosevelt issues this threat, not so subtle, to the British, French, and Germans, essentially saying, we dominate this hemisphere, our bases are close by, we can refuel, we will go to naval war with you if you don't back off of Venezuela. And they did. They took that threat seriously, they retreated out of the hemisphere, and then we made this deal with the Venezuelans basically saying, we'll pay your debts off to those European powers, and in exchange, you give us the naval bases, you're going to give us one-way trade deals, and uh, we will prop up your government. Now, this is good and bad. First of all, Venezuela asked for our help, and we came to them at their behest. Um, and in a way, I'm very glad that this happened. Had the Germans won this little dispute, there would have been German submarine bases all over the coast of Venezuela. 
which would have been devastating to U.S. interests in World War I and World War II. So we muscled them out. We kept them out. But at the same time, one has to ask, what gives us the right to intervene in the business of all of our neighbors? Pure power politics. That was it. We had the might to do it, so it gave us the right to do it. So we did. So that's the Monroe Doctrine. It is a reality in the, in the Caribbean and Central America at this time. The other zone of control is the Pacific, west of California. Now here, there's no even pretense that the United States is uh, helping allies and negotiating with equals. Again, really one has to recognize what's happening is there's this huge power imbalance. The United States is so powerful, these Central American countries so poor and so weak that we could get our way dealing with them, essentially. In the Pacific, it's even more stark. So the U.S. starts to flex its muscles in the mid-19th century. We buy Alaska from the Tsar, and we have military bases there, mineral rights, and we control it. We then start to control Hawaii. Starting in the mid-1800s, United States missionaries discover Hawaii. They realize the natives do not have any knowledge of Jesus Christ, the Gospels, or Christianity, and so they set up shop there, and they start to try to convert native peoples. Mr. Dole discovered the islands and found he could buy land there very cheap and start pineapple plantations. And after you have a U.S. presence there, you have missionaries and you have U.S. economic interests, like Mr. Dole, who owns sugarcane fields and pineapple fields, then there could be uprisings. And so at various times, if the Hawaiian people r rose up against their leaders, seeing them as puppets, then the U.S. Navy would be called in to crush this uprising. This is exactly what happened in 1898, is that there was an uprising of the Hawaiian people, and the U.S. said, we have Christian missionaries there, we have U.S. interests there, they're going to try to take the land back, they're going to try to harm these missionaries who have treaties allowing them, you know, space there. So the U.S. invades Hawaii during this time, brutally crushes the revolt, takes all the land from the native Hawaiian people, and starts a direct colonial system. This was direct rule from Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is some seven time zones east of Hawaii. It's some uh, five, 6,000 miles away, and directly from Washington, D.C., the U.S. is going to rule Hawaii. We're going to put it under our control. It becomes a U.S. territory directly ruled from Washington, D.C., and that's kind of our you know first colony that we'll have there. Um, the same year we are going to uh, conquer the Philippines. Now we had Guam, we would get Midway Island, we would get American Samoa, but really the jewel in the crown, the prized possession was the Philippines. And this comes a as a result of the Spanish-American War. So we defeat the Spanish, we gain the Philippines, and we rule it directly in 1899. Again, annexed by the US, it's gonna be ruled directly, and we appoint a governor directly from Washington, D.C. to rule over the Filipinos. Their land was taken from them, and it was ruled directly. So there's no pretense that even this is an equal country. The U.S. essentially said, this is our empire. We're doing exactly what the British are doing. Now, there was intense debate about this in America. Should we do this? Can we do it? Well, it was done, which leads us to talking about, um, well, just before the Spanish-American War, let's talk about uh, the Boxer Rebellion. So way out in China, there is an uprising there in 1899. China was essentially carved up by European powers in the 18th and 19th centuries. So there were French zones of control. The British had Hong Kong. Uh, many of these countries had basically carved up portions of China. So Germany has colonies there. The British do. The French do. The Russians do. And the Chinese people did not like this. And there was an uprising of a student group there called the Boxers, and they rose up against their puppet queen, the Empress Dowager Sisi, in 1899 to try to overthrow the system, and the revolt got out of control very rapidly. So these European powers, including the Japanese, they're not European, but they control parts of China too, they appeal to us for help, because the U.S. has bases close by in the Philippines. And our president, William McKinley, essentially says, why should we intervene? What's in it for us? And they offer us what was called an open door. So the U.S. actually sends 5,000 U.S. soldiers to China to help brutally crush the Boxer Rebellion. And as a reward, we get an open door to China, meaning we get the right to start selling goods in all of these zones of control. We don't get our own zone of control, but we get the ability of open markets of selling our goods in China. So 
whatever one thinks about this from a moral question, from an economic and power perspective, the U.S. is a global player. By 1900, clearly, the world was what we would call multipolar at the time, that there were many, many great powers. There was the Germans, the British, the French, the Belgians, the Dutch, the Russians, the Japanese, and now the Americans take center stage, and we are co-equal with all these other powers. Next to talk about is the Spanish-American War. I'll keep this short. We don't need to get into all the ins and outs of it. But basically, the U.S. had coveted Cuba for many, many decades. We had offered to buy it numerous times. The Spanish had put it down. It's one of the last colonial possessions they have. They have Cuba, they have Puerto Rico, they have the Philippines in 1898. Now, there was an uprising on the island that had been going on for quite some time, and it just could never quite be snuffed out. The Spanish could never quite find all the rebels and kill or capture them. The rebels at the same time could never quite capture Havana and take over and, and end this revolt. And so the U.S., you know, Key West, Florida, just 90 miles from Havana, we're watching this situation, we're very troubled. And there's all of these newspaper reports coming out of William Randolph Hearst newspapers, and also Joseph Pulitzer's newspapers as well. Every newspaper in the country was having reports every single day about Spanish atrocities, about the Spanish burning down people's cane fields, burning down people's homes, committing atrocities, herding people into concentration camps. Some of it true, some of it exaggerated, some of it just totally made up. And the U.S. becomes more and more and more involved. So much pressure mounts on William McKinley that he asks permission to send a U.S. battleship down to Havana Harbor to have a military presence there, the USS Maine. The Maine explodes one morning, and nobody knows why, but the excuse that Americans will use is that this was a Spanish mine. The Spanish planted a mine, blew up the Maine, and killed dozens of American sailors. Every newspaper read, remember the Maine, to hell with Spain. And McKinley was under immense pressure to now issue an ultimatum, which he did. He issues an ultimatum to the Spanish crown and says, get out of Cuba forever, or there will be war. And they refused to get out. They realized they were going to lose this war, but they, fo they thought it would be better to fight and lose the war and keep their integrity and their pride. Uh, and so that's what happened. It's a very short war. It is 16 weeks, just four months. The United States wins a, an amazing victory. It was by far our most popular war. We did not need a draft. More men volunteered to fight this war than we could possibly need. And the hardest part was really figuring out how to get to Cuba, because we had no amphibious transport or anything like that. The U.S. Navy actually buys cruise liners, packs thousands of men on these cruise liners, and steams them down to Cuba. They have to jump overboard. They swim ashore. Miraculously, we still are able to invade Cuba, take it from the Spanish, and at the same time have our Navy attack Manila Harbor out uh, in the Pacific in the Philippines, and... As a result of this war, the Spanish transfer property to us, the Philippines, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. Now, because of this dynamic, I told you, Cuba essentially becomes a half colony. We sign these treaties with Spain, Cuba gains its independence, but it's a half independence. They have elections, they have their own leaders, but their leaders cannot make treaties with any other country without our consent. They have to buy American goods, there must be American naval bases there. There's still an American naval base there, even though Cuba is a very unfriendly country to the U.S. Guantanamo Bay is still a U.S. military base that we have to this day. We'll get into that later, but when Castro has his revolution in 1959, he knew very well not to attack the U.S. military base. That would give a, an excuse for a full-on American invasion. We didn't intervene because we got to keep our military base. So, uh, Cuba becomes semi-free. The Philippines becomes completely a U.S. possession. There was debate afterwards. Should we set the Filipinos free? Should they be independent? Should we sell it to another country? McKinley got the Philippines really as an after effect, a side effect of the war. He, there was no interest in it beforehand. It was just that we defeated the Spanish. We wanted to cut off their ability to reinforce Cuba with their navy, and so we decimated their navy in Manila Harbor. And then everyone started making offers. The British, the Germans, French said, we'd like to buy it. There was an idea, maybe we should set the Filipinos free. That was actually acknowledged and looked at and said, maybe we should. But it was felt the Filipinos uh, were a very poor people in a poor country at the time, and they would never be able to have independence because they have all these strong, bullying neighbors. The Japanese would take them over, or the Russians, or the British, or the French, or the Germans. 
And so McKinley felt that the only solution would be to temporarily take them over as a colony. This was not ever intended to be for centuries. McKinley felt there would be a tutorial period. This is very insulting, but it would be a tutorial period where Americans would tutor the Filipinos. Missionaries would go out there and convert the native peoples which is supremely ironic. When McKinley gives these speeches, he says, we have to bring Christianity and capitalism to these people. Christianity? Wait a minute. I thought most Filipinos were Christian. They're Catholic. The Spanish had been there for 300 years. To Americans, that wasn't Christian enough. And so the YMCA, the YWCA show up. They start to Christianize people, try to uh, Christianize people and make them Protestants. It doesn't really ever take hold. Um, but the land was taken away. Now, what's not often told, what a lot of Americans don't know, is the Filipinos were not happy to see us. They fought back very strongly against us, and it took years. In fact, the U.S. lost far more soldiers trying to put down this Filipino rebellion than we ever lost fighting Spanish soldiers in Cuba. It's an ugly war. It's a brutal war. It's a war where America committed a lot of atrocities in the Philippines. I don't like to talk about it. It's very upsetting. But this is part and parcel of this global imperial movement at the time. The British were doing the same thing in India, the Dutch were doing the same thing in Indonesia, the uh, Belgians were doing the same thing in the Congo, and we were doing it to the Filipinos. So this is the picture of the, the pinnacle of the American empire. Going into the 20th century, the U.S. has these two zones of control. We have the Caribbean, we have the Pacific, and we are now a global power player. And that essentially ends the lecture. Um, we will do the progressive era in class, and uh, I hope this little experiment succeeded. Thanks a lot.